idea generation for themes can actually be quite creative. This is a creative process. Anything can actually be the starting point for a theme. Uh, our portfolio manager might read about something in the newspaper and this might actually be the starting point for a theme. I mean, with a bit more structure, there's actually two angles of creating a theme. Either you're looking at something top down, so you have the idea of the theme first and then you go about and find uh, the companies that are related to the theme or you actually identify a certain development bottom up. So there's a group of companies that are all affected by something similar. And then you, on closer observation, can identify a common theme uh, for this development. And this then can be the starting point for us to have a closer look at the theme uh, define the theme, what are the drivers behind the theme, what is the expectations that we can have uh, in a theme, really create the universe, what are the companies that are available to invest in, and then finally take a decision whether to own a theme or even how much to own of a theme. Not everything that comes up as an idea immediately enters the portfolio. It might remain on the working list for the time being, but as I said, the, the creation process for the themes really can be a very creative one. Buy and sell decisions for a theme and also the weighting of a theme are actually based on a number of considerations. One of the most important considerations is indeed valuations. So there's a certain signal that comes from the single stock valuations uh, that then applies to the overall theme. I mean, very simply, if everything within the theme appears very expensive, then even if you have a very high conviction to a theme and you have a, a strong long-term outlook, it might not be the right time at this point of time to invest into the theme or it might be appropriate to take down the weighting of the theme for the time being because everything might be richly valued at this point of time. It also works the other way around obviously if everything is, uh, is inexpensive, appears uh, rather cheap then you might increase your conviction and you might increase your weighting um, as well. All in all, the most important decision factor is, however, our conviction. And the conviction is based on all the research that has been put into formulating the theme before. What are the drivers? What are the expectations? How will this unfold? What is available for investments? And based on this, our portfolio managers can take a conviction position. I want to own this theme and I like this theme better than the other theme. And therefore, I want to have more exposure as compared to the other theme. We always have a working list of additional themes. What you see in the portfolio is basically the tip of the iceberg. These are the themes where we have the highest conviction at this point of time. And then you have a number of themes that we're currently putting work in. Some of them might al already be ready to be invested in. Some of them might be a bit more early stage. So we still need to do some research. We still need to find some companies. But there is a list of other themes that you currently don't see in the portfolio. What we are currently looking at are, on the one hand, some of the technology sector related themes. So we are interested in something like metaverse. We are also interested in something like uh, uh, cyber currencies and blockchain um, as well. So if we wanted to go a bit more aggressive in our portfolio, a bit more growth on, depending on the market environment, then these might be instruments of choice in order to change the positioning of the portfolio overall. What we are also interested in very much in a different part of the market is anything that is related to food security. There's plenty of issues along the food value chain, starting with sustainable agriculture. For example, how can we ease the burden that agriculture has on the environment? How can we produce more healthy food as well? How can we avoid food waste? And then finally, how can we incentivize people to actually eat more healthy, um, to have a better diet, to have a better nutrition as well. So there's a lot of aspects that are quite interesting and there's also a lot of development that opens up new opportunities. We think that this is one of the long-term structural changes. So this might be a, a, a theme that uh, we put at work at some stage in the future. We actually call it the pet economy. This is around goods and services, around pets. Think about pet healthcare, for example, or think about pet food. 
The starting point for this theme really is the mega trend of demographic change. Aging population in the industrialized countries means pet adoption rates go up because it's the so-called silver ages, the kids are moving out of the house and you're adopting a pet. But interestingly, there's also higher adopt uh, pet adoption rates for the so-called millennials, so on the other side of the age spectrum, uh, the younger generation as well. They are said to be more social, so they are also more prone to own pets. So we also see rising pet adoption rates there. And then finally, even in emerging markets, we see pet Uh, ownership becoming quite fashionable in the coastal areas of China, the most developed parts of China. If you then combine this with another development, which is basically this humanization of pets, so we are treating the pets like members of the family, they are effectively the kids, and this means you're spoiling the pets, you're treating them uh, very well, and you're not cheap on them, which is not something to be criticized, obviously, but it has economic implications that are interesting for us as investors. Because this is where companies that provide these goods and services around the pet economy can actually benefit and therefore we can benefit as investors. Mm -hmm.